Welcome to the essence of axiomatic set theory. It's the real deal now, we're actually starting. Alright, uh, the way I'm gonna approach this is I want you guys to put yourself in the shoes of someone that's trying to develop a new theory. What you want to do is you want to study about collections of objects. And collections of objects is a bit wordy to say, so you're gonna shorten that down. You're gonna say set instead. So, you want to study sets. You want to know all there is to know about sets. So, what's the first thing you do? The first thing you do is come up with a concrete example so you can get an idea of what we're dealing with. So, how about this? If I were to form a collection consisting of the following objects, the number 2, the number 3, and the number 5, and I'm going to visualize this by placing these objects in the bag as so, then that would be an example of a set. Alright, cool, so that's sets defined. What we now want to do is tackle the problem of communication. Let's say I have a particular set that I am thinking of. Let's just make it the example set we gave earlier. Then what do you think I should say or write down to another person so that they can know about the set that I am thinking of. Well, we can simply write or speak the following sentence to that other person. The set I want you to know about is a collection which consists of the numbers 2, 3, and 5. And of course, this attempt at communication works. I mean, it worked for you guys watching right now, didn't it? But there is one problem with this method, and that is it is too wordy. So let's develop a new way to communicate sets, preferably something more symbolic in nature. What if, if I want to talk about the set, which is a collection of, say, the objects X, Y, and Z, I organize these objects into a list, separate the objects with commas, and then flank the list with brackets. So, for example, if I write this down, you will know that I am talking about a set which consists of the numbers 2, 3, and 5. And if I write this down, you will know that I am talking about the set which consists of the letters S, U, and B. Subscribe, by the way. I realize I've been doing things in triples, but you can make sets of any size you want, even ones that consist of only one object, for example, something like this. Now, here's where a lot of people get confused. This right here is the set which consists of the number 2, and it is important to know that it should be considered as a different object from the number 2 itself, so they're not exactly equal. I will mention at this point that when you're choosing objects to include within a set, it is possible to mix and match different types of objects. For example, we can mix numbers together with letters. Sets themselves are also a type of object, so when we are creating a set and choosing which objects to include within that set, we can of course include, well, sets again, thereby creating a set that consists of a set. If we're going to return to the bag analogy, then it would be the same thing as placing a bag inside of another bag. And we can go down the rabbit hole, creating sets that consist of sets that consist of sets that consist of sets and so on and so forth you get the idea all right cool we know what a set is now and we know how to communicate sets to other people so what now well as with the creation of any new system problems begin to arise two people ask for your wisdom as the creator of the idea of sets to settle a certain debacle Person 1 is thinking of the set bracket 2 bracket and wishes to communicate it to person 2. They say, I am thinking of a set that consists of the number 2. You know, they're communicating with the old fashioned way, but you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And then person 2 writes down on the piece of paper, hands it over to person 1. Is this the set you're thinking of? They asked. No, no, person 1 scribbles down the set they were thinking of and hands the paper back. This is what I'm thinking of, they said. 
And person 2 complains, well, what's wrong with my set? It also consists of the number 2, it's, it's just as you described. And so now they turn to you for an answer. But you have no time to act, because at the same time, another group comes in, and they bring with them a similar issue. I am thinking of the following set. I told them I am thinking of a set consisting of the numbers 2 and 3, but this is what they wrote down instead. So, combining these two problems together, this is what you have to decide. Should we worry about the order of the objects within a set, and also how many copies of the same object there are in a set? Well, why not forget about that? Let us tackle the bigger picture. Really, our problem would be solved if we have some sort of rule that allows us to decide whether or not two sets are equal to one another. Huh, a rule. Well, that sure does sound familiar, doesn't it? An axiom is basically a mathematician's way of saying rule. So what does this rule, this axiom, you know, let's be more professional here, look like? Well, it is called the axiom of extensionality, and it looks something like this. I know, I know, this looks a bit scary, but we'll try to figure out what it all means. First things first, we need to try to understand, you know, what all of these symbols mean. Let us start with this symbol right here, which apparently doesn't have a name as far as I know. Basically, it is shorthand for is contained in. So if you want to communicate to a person that some object x is contained in a set A, then we can simply write this down. The object x is contained in the set A. We put the object on the left hand side and the set on the right hand side. So for example, if I want to communicate that number 1 is in this set, then we can write this down. We can also replace the number 1 on the left side with 2 or 3 and the statement will remain valid. If we put anything else like the number 4, then this will become an invalid statement. We can fix this by placing a diagonal strike on the symbol in the middle. And now it means is not contained in. So the statement now reads 4 is not contained in the set that contains 1, 2, and 3. Slight digression. The language I'm using now is not entirely accurate. From now on, instead of saying that the object x is contained in a set A, we shall say that x is an element of A. This is just how everybody else says it, and we need to conform to the majority. But it means the exact same thing, so just don't worry about it. To understand the next symbol, we need to understand what the following statement means. Here's how I like to understand you know, logic-type statements like these. We can think of it as some machine whose input is determined by whatever is on the left side of the comma, and whose output is determined by whatever is on the right side of the comma. Let's focus on the input portion. The upside-down letter A basically means any. So this machine is allowed to accept any object x that is an element of A as an input. And it should be able to provide x is an element of B as an output. Let's try this out on the real example, just to make things more clear. Let A be this set and B be this set. So we're able to accept x is equal to 1 as an input because 1 is inside of A. So the question now is, can we produce 1 is in B as an output? And the answer is, yeah, it's a true statement, so there's no problem with that. We should also check that there's nothing wrong with using x is equal to 2 as an input. And surely, since 2 is inside of B, we can output that statement as well, and we'll have no problems. So that's it. All the options are exhausted. So we know that the statement here is in fact true. I can accept any element of A, and in return, produce the following statement. We've checked all the possibilities, so we know that this is true. But what if I were to change A into this set instead? We know there's nothing wrong with using 1 and 2 as inputs, so all we need to do is check the case when x is equal to 5. So let's try it out. We input x is equal to 5, and now we want to produce 5 is inside of B as an output. Can we do that? No, we can't, because that's a false statement. Our machine is not allowed to output false statements 
machines, computers, they're supposed to be correct. So something went wrong there. And therefore, this statement now becomes invalid if we switch A to this different set. Basically, this statement is a really complicated way of saying that everything that is inside of A should also be inside of B. And since 5 is not inside of B, well then the statement is just invalid now. This statement we just discussed can be shortened by introducing a new symbol, the subset symbol. So when we say that A is a subset of B, it is exactly the same thing as saying that this statement above is true, i.e. that everything inside of A is also going to be inside of B. So for example, we can say this, but not this. Again, drawing a diagonal dash over the subset symbol gives it the opposite meaning. So now this statement reads, the set that consists of 1, 2, and 5 is not a subset of the set consisting of 1, 2, and 3. So there we have it. Those are the basic symbols covered. And now we're ready to try to begin to understand the axiom of extensionality. But unfortunately, this video is taking longer than expected, so I will split this lesson into two parts. We'll try to break down what the axiom of extensionality means in the next video, so see you until then.